Hello and welcome to this week's Talking Point. We're looking at Autism Spectrum Disorder. It's Unit 2 of the six units. I'm joined by Dr. Sophie Drennan. Very um, welcome um, to this week's Talking Point because you run the Autism, Asperger's and ADHD module at University of Derby Online. I do, yes. It um, runs over the summer trimester, so it's currently in week four. Um, and the topics we cover are obviously in incredibly similar to the MOOC. Great stuff. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you some questions, and we're getting into a bit of discussion about autism, and I'm sure that will be um, going into some hot topics as well, because we've <laughs> both got strong views on, on autism, which are partially represented in, in, in the MOOC materials. But let's, let's drill down into that in, in just a second. Before then, um, what I want to do is just give you a brief recap of the, the unit material. So I'm just going to quickly whiz through some of the key points from the section, which will hopefully act um, as a sort of reminder of, of some of the stuff that we've, we've put in as academic content there. There's also a question I, I want to um, cover um, from the comments. Um, that, that have come up as well. Before we do so, I just wanted to point out that there has been a slight technical issue in the comments uh, section of, I think it's the, um, the part where everyone's introducing themselves. You can post to that, that's absolutely fine, but you might have some problems in seeing your post. The technicians are working on that and we're looking for a solution, so bear with us with that one and we'll try to solve that as soon as, as we can. So then let's just look at autism spectrum disorder in brief. Um, I've got my notes in front of me, so forgive me if I look down. I'm just literally reading from, from the page here. So in terms of the content then of the section, we saw autism as a, a lifelong developmental condition. Um, we know it's usually first diagnosed in, in childhood and it affects people to varying degrees. So it's a, a condition which is often classed as a sort of a spectrum of, of, of different um, markers or identifiers, if you like. And there's this notion of the triad of impairment with social communication problems, uh, language problems, and um, characterizing autism as a sort of narrow band of, mm. of, of um, special interests or a restricted sort of repertoire of, of, um, of behaviors. It's somewhat of a, a slightly sort of archaic way of looking at autism, but a lot of the research literature still sort of harks back to that so-called triad of impairments there. And we covered that just as more historical reference and a way of getting to grips with um, some of the core underlying markers of the, of the condition. So of course now in the DSM-5, um, Asperger's syndrome or Asperger's disorder, um, however you want to, to call it, is now taken under the wing of autism spectrum disorder or ASD and included, whereas previously it wasn't. And in the, the um, materials, we, we covered a little bit about the changes in diagnostic uh, categorization, but that's something we'll come on to a little bit later as well in, in subsequent units there. So some people with autism are profoundly affected by the symptoms and need constant care, and indeed will need care for the rest of their lives. And it's very truly a chronic and pervasive developmental disorder spreading you know, across all elements of their lives. But other people, um, for other people, it's completely different. And there are more subtle um, identifiers, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes referred to as, uh, have you heard the term high-functioning autism? Yes, um, which I think a lot of people identify with Asperger's yeah, syndrome. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I suppose high-functioning because we think of it more as in cognitive intellectual capabilities, where there's kind of high to average IQ. Mm. But I think it should also relate as well to the behaviours exhibited yeah. and I suppose the day-to-day -day coping of having a disorder which may not actually be that visible. Yeah, so th there's often this idea that autism can be um, a hidden disorder. Mm. So one talks of this, the spectrum, the autistic mm. spectrum, which is a continuum of severity of symptoms, but it's also heterogeneic in the sense that there's lots of different elements of that and greater variance if you want to use a sort of statistical term there so autism or autisms is many different things i in in the the um campus module that i teach here at university of derby i talk of autisms in, and that includes asperger's syndrome as well so there are many pathways to that categorization there um one of the sort of buzz phrases i often use is this, um you know no route into autism so there's no route out of autism in, in that sense so there's no single way in so there can't be any single 
way of alleviating the symptoms or remediating, or some people say cure, don't they? It's a bit, sort of a bit of a hot topic. To <laughs> <laughs> and that actually brings us on to the terminology and the ways of speaking about autism, which I think we, we'll probably get into in a second. I've got a number of questions I really want to ask you. <laughs> we I know. be here for a while. Oh. <laughs> let's, well, let's, let's see how we get on. So let's, um, before we do that, I, I just want to cover this um, question that's come up then on, on the, uh, the comments forum here. Um, this is by uh, Cara, and, and um, she wants to know more about um, uh, autism in, in males versus um, females. Mm. So she says, boys are referred for help four times as often as girls, but it's not fully known as to why. I find this to be interesting. I was wondering if doctors are still researching as to why males are more likely to be diagnosed with autism. And that's a fantastic question. Yeah, and very pertinent, um, well, kind of at the moment, because she's right, there is a lot of research current at the moment in relation to the impact of gender, mm. both in obtaining a diagnosis, but also, I suppose, in reaction to um, the symptoms they or their own actual experiences. Where I think the research is focusing on whether females are better able to cope or mask the symptoms, and so are being yeah. missed in relation to a diagnosis perhaps not until later on in life well that, yeah that's i mean that's one of the things that's quite apparent that the presentation of autism in males and females girls and boys most often um, when they're first diagnosed is very very different so the true ratio actually isn't isn't known uh, and and that of the true ratio of autism of course isn't isn't actually known uh, we know approximately the diagnostic rates in some publications, you know, academic papers, they say about three to one, some say f five to one, so more prevalent in boys than girls. But as you say, the, the symptoms can be masked in, in girls, and I think that um, that does represent a lot of the missed diagnosis. Um, of course, there's misdiagnosis where or diagnosis where you may be diagnosed with the wrong condition, which has got you know quite. Um, um, a bad reputation for psychiatry with people realizing that they haven't for instance got you know oppositional defiant disorder they've got ADHD or they haven't got um, OCD they've got autism or, you know. yeah I think that's a really good point and I think we're going to touch on it a bit later in relation to talking about comorbidity mm. and it perhaps especially persons in later life or young adulthood may go to their GP or seek counseling help for something that may be in addition, say if right. they're depressed or they're anxious and they're struggling to cope in everyday life, but they're not sure why, why they're not getting the same things as everybody else or they don't react the same way to the people they seem around them, they don't automatically think it's because they may be autistic yeah. until they go to the GP and it's actually and the penny presented drops. to them. <laughs> yes, saying, yeah. well, this could be related to this and this is why you could be feeling so anxious. But, but also with girls, there's the highest social expectation, isn't there? So girls are, are I think, more likely to be put in this category of well you know you need to play with other girls you need to be doing this you need mm. to be doing that and you know and we know that the girls are more advanced in terms of their their language skills for example and their, their social well their social just but it's not just social language but their ability to socialize than girl, than boys yeah so i think that that sex difference related to their chronological age actually is probably um, reflected in the higher rates of diagnosis for boys rather than girls because there's an, there is an apparent sex difference from outset. Yeah, there's the, the social expectations where genders, especially at focusing on the West, yeah. there are the expectations that a male will act or respond in one way, a female should react and respond in another way. So young boys are expected to be less verbal, more physical, mm -hmm. where the, let's say aggressive tendencies or almost not the norm and I'm not talking overt aggression no 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 but just in reactions um, whereas girls are encouraged to be more verbal more considerate or take more consideration of themselves within social settings and with others um, there is that tendency to focus more on emotion based mm. coping so again that could be a, a possible causative factor for why a it's not picked up mm. Um, or individuals themselves aren't recognising that what they're doing is not perhaps that comfortable for them. Until they get older, 
and perhaps the necessity not to compromise so much. Like we, we spoke about this before recording it about mm. how when you're a young child through primary school, your differences or quirks are almost lauded mm. or petted that it's a good thing to be precocious or that you know it's considered funny to be the little kid who always brings the stuffed animal with him or wants to talk about the moon for, for hours on end but then when you actually reach more middle school comprehensive school it is all about compromise and that's where difficulties begin to be identified I think and then yeah. when you get older you get to a more well well yeah. actually I don't really <laughs> care anymore what people <laughs> think so there's this tension isn't there in, in certainly in between psychology and psychiatry and this notion of um, clinically definable or disorders and pathology mm. which is straight out of the medical model which we, we've spoken about on the, the units of the MOOC and we'll go on to cover in more detail and you know this social construction of both our role in society in relation to what some people call neurotypicality and pathology I suppose what it means to be normal mm. as a man or a woman a girl or a boy so all of this this big literature feeds into this but also in the sex differences we can look at the biological elements as well and I think it's true to say and there's good evidence that there are underlying genetic and biological differences for example Professor Simon Baron Cohen mm. for many many years has put forward his extreme male brain theory of autism which is actually more more of a general theory. He doesn't necessarily claim the the, the theory um, rests on um, autism particularly. It's just the the extreme end of that that idea that um, what you can have extreme male characteristics that they might be more like autism. And in fact, he says that is autism. Mm. Um, in fact, I, I was talking to him many years ago, and I said. I said, um, Simon, well, you can have the extreme male brain, can't you? What about the extreme female brain? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what he said? Oh, go on and tell me. <laughs> I was expecting him to say, oh, no, actually, yeah, this is a, you know, a condition that we're coming into, into the fall more and it's going to be a new diagnosis. And <laughs> no, he, he, just, he just said, yeah, well, actually, that it's quite possible. It's just that that doesn't present with pathology because these people, they would be extreme empathizers rather than extreme systemizers perhaps the counsellors, the therapists, the more okay. touchy-feely type people, much in tune with... <laughs> oh, we're going down roots tune. now. So it's somewhat of a, a superficial way of looking at autism, which we know is a you know, heritable brain-based um, disorder, if you're using diagnostic terminology. Yeah. But there are other ways of looking at autism there as well. Is. I mean, regardless of kind of your own personal opinions as to Baron Cohen's kind of theoretical framework there mm. I mean there would be being a biological psychologist in particular um, th there is that distinct possibility that the role of hormones does have mm. and we know they do have a considerable impact on physiological processes on yep. neurological mm. functioning so there is that argument that in the physiological respect there could be that extreme male brain extreme female brain but I mm. think people do take his kind of hypothesis may be a bit too literally. Well, that's sometimes. it, yeah. <laughs> and, and these are theories. So yes. They're, they're just ideas. And theories are meant to be explored and argued. We all they know are. that in psychology. Yeah. Um, but exploring that, that biological cause for sex differences, at least, people like David Skews have, have suggested that um, autism, whatever autism is, might be located on the X chromosome. And if that is the case, at least some types of autism, then we know that boys inherit only one from the mother, but girls two, and that may that may, def may afford them some protection. This is a sort of developing theory about sex differences in autism, and may account mm. and buy into some of these more um, uh, more generic theories, things like Baron Cohen's ideas around um, sex differences in the extreme male brain. So there are we, there are different frameworks that we can look at this: the social construction, the biological, the psychological, straight from psych um, psychiatry, and all of these provide just ways into thinking about autism. I think. Anyway, I mean, we could carry on like this all day. <laughs> I, yes. I have some questions that I'd like to put to you, if that's that's okay. And maybe we'll just work through those and see where they, they take yeah, us. Then. I was Now, you've got a bit of a background in autism and some personal ex experience, which I'd like to um, ask you about. And um, 
feel free to take the questions any way you want. But the first one I wanted to ask was about your background and experience of autism. Well, apart from teaching as a psychologist, which I've done for this institution and my previous institution as well, it's it's not, it's come from more of a personal background mm -hmm. from having experience of individuals within the family right. um, and it is that juxtaposition of knowing individuals and I make a point to signpost the word individuals because that is something prominent I think that needs to be discussed with autism mm -hmm. and then also knowing about these theories the theoretical frameworks we talk about and either corresponding them to what you witness, what you experience, what you just see on a day-to-day -day basis and you don't even think twice off because these are people that you know and love and grown yeah. up with yeah. and they're not also arguing against that because you see these very umbrella theories being proposed with a very us and them perspective going autistic people do this and they do that and then you turn around to the people you know going well no <laughs> it's like where's that come from yeah. it's like just because that's it's not an umbrella term so it it interests me in that point and and I think it is incredibly important for us to make sure that and it sounds really basic that if you do research or have an interest in autism as a psychologist or a clinician is that you actually make a point or bother to know people with autism yeah because yeah, they're absolutely. the ones who are going to tell you what it is actually like yeah as opposed to us telling them what it is My, they're like. <laughs> <coughs> i've worked with people with autism more at the high functioning end if you want to use that, that terminology it reminds me of the f my first experience of uh, coming into contact with any with anyone with with autism was I was doing some voluntary work with a, um, a society that uh, befriended people on uh, with on the spectrum with Asperger's and um, after suitable training this was many 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 years ago um, I was um, allocated um, uh, to this really really nice chap who was um, on who basically had Asperger's and we would go out for coffees and things and uh, the idea was to to help um, this chap have a little bit more social uh, element to his daily life. And I think it was first, maybe the first or second. And I think it's about the second time we went out for a coffee in Marks and Spencer's coffee shop or whatever it was. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> claim the money back. <laughs> um, so he got up out of his seat and um, was just randomly going up to people, and he was talking about his specialist area of interest. Uh, and, and he was, I'm quite tall, and he, he probably he was three or four inches taller than me. So okay. six foot something guy, quite muscly, <laughs> uh, probably 25 years old, to look at quite... Um, Intimidating. Intimidating, right? that's the word. That's, that's the word. word. <laughs> but his specialist area of interest was, was handguns. Okay. So he would initiate <laughs> conversations with complete strangers on like Hecker and Cop automatic weapons or, or the latest, you know, ammunition specifications or something, assuming that they would be interested mm. and not really letting them go. So you can see how that would be highly inappropriate and really scary. But yes. this is that lack of that apparent lack of um, self-reflection about the consequences of one's action. Yeah. And you pick an interesting term there because it's the other, there's the other way around is that the awareness that for for those who may not have much contact or much experience or much knowledge or and we do see it a lot in academia where some aspects may be very scary yeah. to other people who yeah. don't understand where something may be coming from especially if someone is say high functioning where it's not immediately obvious um, you know, situations where I've seen you know, men in their 40s, high functioning, where it's all gotten too much and they burst into tears yeah. and nobody knows how to react. Yeah. And I mean, the, these are r real disabilities in, yeah. in the sense that one can say they're mild or moderate along that spectrum of um, that continuum um, of severity and this, the, the, the wonderful stuff that it brings there's also profound disability that comes with it mm. so 
although it's it's quite right to talk of autism and to reclaim it in a, in a positive light it's also really important to acknowledge that it's a disability um, I think one of the things that the National Autistic Society is, is working on at the moment in their campaigns is to emphasize the point that it's not just about autism awareness it's about mm. autism understanding mm. um, and most people aren't know of autism but they've found in their research that very few people actually fully understand what autism is and where they're getting the information from it's fun when we say knowledge of autism mm. and you think back to oh my gosh now I'm kind of revealing my age a bit too much but maybe is it 30 years ago when the film Rain Man oh, came yeah, out yeah. because that is always something that people bring up and that was, I think, the first time something like that had been out there. They'd even heard the term autistic mm. savant. But then it was kind of an either-or situation, right? That you were either an autistic savant or you were brilliant at yeah. maths and acted like Dustin Hoffman's character, who I know is based on a real character, mm. or nothing at all. So, and I think that almost, it's tarnished a bit of the understanding in relation to what say the general public are aware of if they haven't got that own personal experience mm, not everyone and with autism has a special ability no totally or has got well again it's about the individual isn't it it's not everyone is like temple grandin not everyone is going to be like say your cousin or your sister or your brother mm. who has a diagnosis and it 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 does get very, it is a bit of a minefield when you're talking about classifications and categorizations mm. because regardless of what term you use, you're bound to offend somebody along the line. Yeah, I mean, the, the, statistically, there is a slightly higher number for, in terms of frequency of people with savant abilities in the autistic mm. community or of those people diagnosed with autism. One has to be careful about how you speak about um, um, people with a diagnosis for issues of political sensitivity and quite rightly so but as you know these uh, these savant abilities are just a, a very very small percentage of all of the people represented on the autistic spectrum yes anyway we, we digress <laughs> I knew we would <laughs> um, so how do you feel about the way that people talk about autism then what, what's your what's your view on how do we frame autism what is what's the way to talk about autism is well it's it's with anything that provides a definition for anything it there's there's personal preferences yeah there's the politically correct preference there's the the, the medical diagnosis preference as I say I'm very much aware that I try to avoid the us and them terminology but then again um, that is something that people who identify as being part of the autistic community the the Aspie the Asperger's community are very comfortable with and they've taken mm. ownership of it so I think it's it's whatever makes someone feel comfortable I think labeling in general is is it's a bit of a poison chalice mm. just anyway mm. um, where it can be good to identify something but at the same respect it brings a lot of response it's like the spider-man film it brings a lot of responsibilities yeah. to be to be classified with a diagnosis where in some respects there's a relief of knowing Oh my God! It's not it's not me so much. It's it's something I can't control. But then that awareness of oh my God! It's something I can't change. Is something that's quite hard to deal with. So when it comes to to labels, I using the the given terminology mm. when we teach autistic spectrum disorder yeah. and also <coughs> now the changes in the, the the DSM and it's about levels, um, mild and severe autism. But mm. I would you personally... You wouldn't use the, the word mild, though. Oh, yeah, see, <laughs> and I was very kind of hesitant because that is something I get a bit kind of het up about because, right. you know, it's dependent on whoever you're talking... If you're talking to someone who has a diagnosis or who tells you they've had a diagnosis, mm. that the courteous thing you would do with anyone would be like, how, how would you like me to approach that? Mm. Yeah, how <laughs> you know, would you you're prefer be like, oh, you're for disabled, me to refer then. to that? Yeah, if you ask the person... 
because they're ultimately in charge of and it's like talking to anyone you know well exactly <laughs> Because, well, I mean, before we started so, recording... Should I call you Simon? Yeah, or should yeah, I call yeah, you that's it. Yeah, it's, I yeah. think it's just, just it's the courtesy, or they might be so. quite open themselves to say, oh, this mm. is, I refer to myself as. Mm. But it, it's all very subjective. But shall we talk about the mild and severe kind of aspects... <clears throat> Definitely. ...of it? Yeah. Um, because that does refer to... It's more cognizant with the the behaviour exhibited. So, if we say someone has severe autism, you automatically think it's in relation to kind of a, a kind of very detrimental, socially inappropriate behaviour. Yeah. Maybe non verbalization Someone who's, as you said, is not able to live independently. Um, whereas mild autism is more in relation to someone who's high functioning, but I have a, 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 an issue, as I know many do, where mild al almost infers that, oh, they're almost normal. Mm. You know, you're almost one of us, so to speak. And it doesn't take into consideration that person who's having to cope on a daily basis with the experiences that they're putting in such a lot of um, cognitive and emotional effort Whereas when they do have a meltdown, mm. which they will definitely do at some point, which will be debilitating and traumatic for them and and others, how on earth can that be classed as mm. being mildly autistic? And it's underestimated just how much effort some people put in each and every day, 24-7, to appearing to be normal mm. or neurotypical, as some people would like to, to conform. To. Yeah. And so then is it any less mild <laughs> because of the presentation? Yes. It's, so it's what you see is what you get, mm. and it's under the surface. And again, to be socially acceptable, to not scare people, mm. to... To fit in, to, to conform. It. And from I'm well aware that that can normally take, or from my experience of those, a heck of a lot of practice. Yeah. There's, there is actually practice, and I'm very much aware and witnessed almost a confrontation when someone was talking to a person I know who was who identifies as having Asperger's, saying, yeah. oh, but you're ever so socially adept. You know, yeah. you go to parties, you're there, you talk, you do. And they said, yes, but it's on my own terms. And I practice, you haven't stood in front of a mirror practicing mm. your facial expressions kind of for three weeks before you do something. And mm. and in one way, they were terribly more socially adept than others within whatever environment it was because they actually put in the work to do mm. it and said yeah I only stay for an hour I do what I practiced I do the conversation I listen I make a point to listen okay this is the point I listen this is how I'm going to respond in this scenario I look there I talk there I use this facial expression they can do it for an hour and then they're gone yeah and any more so would just be too much well some of the most um uh, problematic symptoms again you have to worry about how you are they symptoms markers identifiers uh, traits um, of autism um, that the most problematic are, are the sensory sensitivities um, and mm -hmm. these are things that crop up in a, like the sound of that water cooler water just cooler. coming on now <laughs> you may not have heard it but what I what I did there was to attenuate that and hold it in in my if like working memory and then it's like with ADHD. I talk about this in the in the in the unit quite quite a lot. I've got cognitive processes, automatic processes that allow me mm. not to concentrate on that. But for a person with either ADHD mm. and and autism to the same extent, a lot of the time, this is inc incredibly disrupting. It could be yeah. the scratchiness of your jumper, or the sounds of a car going by, or some just someone breathing in a lecture theatre. <laughs> <laughs> and we've all, we've all, but yeah, um, I don't know people who can't go into boots yeah. because the lighting is so disruptive. Yeah. That's the best word. It is just so intensely LED, I suppose. Mm. But since the, I don't know what kind of lighting boots you use, I'm sure other high street shops may use the same. <coughs> but they they can't, they cannot literally go into the shop. Well, they're more sensitive to the, the flicker as well, and mm. smells, and smells, sounds, yeah. any of the senses really can crop up as triggers. And if, you know, people, from my experience, people with, who identify as having autism, mm. however we want to frame it, 
um, have triggers which can can lead them to um, very very stressful reactions if they can't get themselves out or if they can't make mm. reasonable adjustments or adaptations there's real problems of actually being in in the world because of these things and Temple Grandin talks about it quite a lot mm. in some of her, her uh, lectures I recommend those um, Okay, so let's move on slightly, if, if, if we may. Um, what I wanted to ask you about then, I mean, there's so much I wanted to, to ask you, but we've got limited time. Um, maybe we should just talk about how the public and professionals should understand autism a little bit more. So what, what are the sort of key things that people should understand about autism, mm. uh, both professionals and and the public, mm. if we can ever make that distinction? Well, this is a tricky one, isn't it? There's, mm. no, there's not going to be a, a short, fast answer for, to that because there needs to be, I suppose, that umbrella awareness, the mm. general a generalities of it all. And then that segues into the individuals. And that's the important thing as well. You have right. to take each individual, as you would with any situation, as that person. So you can have a general awareness or understanding of certain symptoms, behavioural aspects, issues, communication, um, which I think actually both as psychologists and just the, mm. the, the general public are more aware of now um, through media and just more, there's more transparency, there is more communication about it out there. But it's still, you still can't approach every individual with that general mm. idea because then that's when misinterpretation and um, kind of offence basically can mm. occur, even if it's well-intentioned, I think. A starting point could be, you know, what autism isn't, rather than what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it isn't, it isn't the, the stereotypical Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man type thing, it isn't the savant. No. It is, for every person with autism, there, there are infinite number of other people mm. with the traits of autism, who, who may have autism, but are entirely different. Yes, and there's very much um, kind of related, I suppose, issues, disorders that could be, for when we're talking about the hypersensitivity, you mm. can also not be autistic, but be a highly sensitive person. Of course, yeah, So absolutely. again, it's just kind of, <coughs> you know, after discussing kind of being highly sensitive, we don't want to scare anybody out there who's like, oh my God, I can't go into boots either because it's mm. too much. Mm. But that could also doesn't necessarily mean that you are therefore going to attract a diagnosis of being mm. autistic because of that one thing. And this is where psychiatry falls over somewhat because we, we try to force people into these categories which are, in terms of the psychological ones, are mainly diagnosed on the observation of, a, a, uh, of behaviour and case history and um, some cognitive assessments with autism. It's more, well, we explain that in the, in, in the, um, in the later units. But within psychiatry, the medical model here, we're trying to fit people into convenient categories that then we can say, right, you have this, therefore we'll treat it like this mm. way. So it's this, this caused by this, it's these symptoms, it's this treatment. And that's not a good fit to autism. <laughs> no, there's no wonder drug. Um, there's no therapy. You can't say, oh mm. yes, we're going to address the behaviours with cognitive behaviour therapy. No, because the behaviours aren't consciously decided upon. Well, it might work for some of the secondary symptoms. I mean, and, th and then it can be valuable for you know, anxiety, you know, any stresses that come up, depression, stuff like that. The phobias, which are highly related to ob obsessive compulsive disorder, some of the comorbidity with ADHD and other dis disorders, impairments. But when we use the term disorder, we're referring to the diagnostic manuals, not that mm -hmm. that person's disordered or impaired or afflicted with this disease. Yeah. Because the diagnostic manuals, the ICD-10 and the DSM-5 currently, um, refer to disorder and impairment. Mm. And, um, and that's what we as psychologists tend to use yeah, but we, but when they, we talk about disorders. They're used in an <laughs> academic framework, not a, a, a social sort of personal way. So I think there's, there's some discrepancy and missing information and misinterpretation of how these terms, terms are used. Really interesting. I do want to progress. <laughs> Let's just move move, move us on. Um, so how, how do you view comorbidity? I know it's a, a huge, huge topic. We do cover it in a, in a subsequent unit of, of this course. But comorbidity and autism, what's your take on that? Um, 
bit of a tangent. Mm. I mean, I'm again because I'm a, a biological psychologist. I'm very much interested in the genetic relationships as well in mm. relation to, you know, uh, families um, and individuals in families exhibiting, say, autistic spectrum disorders, mm. um, schizophrenia, yeah. bipolar disorders, and then also clinical depression. Um, there's the there does seem to be, I don't know whether it's kind of wishful thinking that we want to tie everything together and make it a very nice, neat mm. little bow, but, um, and as you touched on before, the comorbidity of, say, um, issues such as clinical depression, which again is a disorder mm. in its own right, it's not necessarily something that people with autism will also suffer from oh, no, no, because no, they're not. autistic. It's the, the same development as some, uh, an in, an individual class as being neurotypical mm. but it's it's also how to treat those persons who are autistic and the best treatment paths for them if they have different comorbid disorders whatever they might be mm. because there needs to be awareness ag again where the treatments medical treatments might not yeah. be affected drug treatments certain therapies certain I don't know, even a kind of physical therapies might not be appropriate for that person because mm. they have autism, whereas it might be more effective with someone who may not have issues mm. with sensitivity or having people be in their space or verbal communication. Mm. Um, it's something that I think there's a lot, from a purely kind of professional point of view, there's a lot of avenues of research and we are very just much at the tip of the iceberg. And it's until we actually get more information from pe from the individuals who experience these issues that we can kind of proceed a bit further. Because now you, you can have a dual diagnosis, can't you, in the DSM-5. Before, they th 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 that wasn't allowed. Now we can go forward with, say, ADHD and autism mm. at the same time and treat both. Whereas one, before, we'd take the four. You'd have to treat the autism yeah. first and then the ADHD set. Second, yeah, there'd be a, a primary, primary, yeah, kind of almost and like a yeah, like a hierarchy of this is more important than that. Yeah, and of course, that's not the case. It's just the way it's classified. <laughs> yeah. God, it's a minefield. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've we've come to the end, I think, of of the, the the main questions I wanted to ask you. Thanks very much for inputting to that. You're welcome. Can we end? I know we're running out of time, but I know we wanted to kind of almost also kind of make a point to say, look, it's it's very easy to, to view things from or perceive it from a negative perspective yeah. all the time. We're very much kind of going, ah, oh, well, there's this and that, and this could impact. But it's also important to bring up the, the positive aspects. Mm, of the, course, yeah. You know, the, the, the fact that obviously all individuals, it is about coping and managing and need to kind of eliminate this kind of set thinking of autism people can't do this, can't do that. As I was saying, I've known plenty of autistic people, even though they're not supposed to have um, abstract thinking skills mm. to the forefront, who cope via drama and creative outputs and may not be verbally communicative, but can write the most amazing prose and, mm. you know, are quite happy to do figure skating and with, with couples. There isn't, there shouldn't be that kind of concrete block. It's all about what you can't do. Again, as an individual, it's about showing your strengths and showing mm. what you can do. Yeah, there, there, there's so different. many. There's so many positive elements to, to autism. There is the, the sense that you know it's right to talk of autism as a disability. Quite rightly so, because that moves us forward with making appropriate accommodations. Mm. But also, it's, it's sometimes difficult to lose sight of the positive elements of autism and Asperger's syndrome as well. That's a nice point to end on. So. Always end on a positive. Yeah, always end on a positive. <laughs> Thanks. So I wish you well in the rest of your study, and I hope you enjoy the, the units to come. Uh, as always, please contribute to the, the forum, the comments there, and continue to raise any questions you may have. And we'll um, tie up again next week in the next talking point. Thanks a lot. Thank you.